Now, if, as I was saying just now, they were to laugh at me, as you say they do at you, it would not be at all unpleasant to pass the time at court with jests and laughter. Plato, Euthyphro. Hello again. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his savvy squire. Now we have a dinner scene. Note two aspects. First, the presence of a gravely serious ecclesiastic like those who often govern the households of princes. Second, Sancho's anecdote about a similar dinner that an Hidalgo once held for a farmer. The ecclesiastic is a complex figure. On the one hand, the narrator tells us that this man has a resentful and overly censorious personality, like those who, since they were not born princes themselves, never successfully instruct those who are how they should be, like those who want the greatest of the nobility to be measured according to the meagerness of their spirits, like those who, in an effort to show those whom they govern how to be restrained, end up making them miserly. On the other hand, he is critical of Don Quixote in a way that recalls Cervantes' attack on the books of chivalry. He warns the Duke that it was nonsensical to read such nonsense and calls our knight's antics stupidities and hollow acts. This is a paradox. The novel about Don Quixote that the Duke has been reading is itself a parody of chivalric fantasy, but the ecclesiastic has taken it at face value as if it were the kind of chivalric romance criticized by humanists like Erasmus and Vives. Does Cervantes hide his humanist tendencies here, or does he expose how humanists themselves can become self-righteous? Either way, he distinguishes between sincere romance and subtle satire. Did you know? Desiderius Erasmus and Juan Luis Vives were the principal humanist reformers of the Catholic world at the beginning of the 16th century. The Counter-Reformation repressed texts by both men. Sancho's anecdote focuses on caste distinctions. As such, it's actually a miniature version of the chapter we are reading. What prompts Sancho to tell his story? He witnesses a battle over decorum between the Duke and Don Quixote. First, Don Quixote resists sitting at the head of the table, but after much urging, he agrees. The ecclesiastic sits across from him, highlighting their conflict. Sancho seizes the opportunity. I'll tell you a story that happened in my village concerning this issue of seating arrangements. Note the comical social discomfort here as Sancho tells Don Quixote that he will not forget his master's recent advice about speaking too long and being brief. Sancho embarrasses Don Quixote, who is forced to lie about having given him advice. I remember no such thing, Sancho. Don Quixote begs the Duke and Duchess to forgive the impertinence of his squire, even suggesting that your highnesses order this fool removed from here. Hinting at a feminist alliance between her and Sancho, the Duchess comes to the squire's rescue. Sancho is not to stray from my side so much as a stitch. He thanks her. Many sensible days may your holiness live for the good faith and credit that you have extended me. Sancho's anecdote involves real figures from recent Spanish history who were involved in a disastrous military expedition sent to relieve Spanish troops in North Africa. In other words, Sancho's tale assesses Spanish imperialism. He even attempts to get Don Quixote to confirm the lineages of the characters of his story. Don Quixote admits that his squire tells the truth, but urges him to finish quickly. The ecclesiastic is also annoyed by the dilations and pauses with which Sancho told his story. Again, the Duchess defends the squire, saying he should speak as long as he wishes. And again, we note how often Cervantes' art of storytelling concerns the art of storytelling. Sancho's story centers on an Hidalgo who insisted on honoring his peasant neighbor. The neighbor refused to sit at the head of his host's table, but the Hidalgo finally forced him to do so. Placing both hands on his shoulders, he forced him to sit down, saying, sit down, you idiot, for wherever I sit will be the head of the table for you. 
On its surface, the story is another example of Sancho's long-windedness. If we read carefully, however, it also highlights Don Quixote's arrogant disregard for his own squire. It echoes, for example, the preamble to Don Quixote's Golden Age speech in chapter 11 of part one, where our knight forced Sancho to sit beside him. Note also how Sancho praises the Hidalgo host of his story, who has since died. May his soul rest in peace, for he's dead now, and people tell me that all signs indicated that he died like an angel. We might ask ourselves, has some aspect of Don Quixote died recently? Note how Sancho claims that his story is not out of place. And there you have my story. And in truth, I believe that it has not been told here without purpose. The irony, of course, is that Sancho has consciously constructed a story that criticizes his own master's arrogance. Finally, the narrator's description of Don Quixote's shame also hints at race. Don Quixote turned a thousand different colors which all flashed and shifted like marble over his dark skin. Quixotic Mission To what policy does Sancho refer at the beginning of his anecdote about seating arrangements? A. The struggle to control North Africa B. The occupation of Texas C. The conquest of Guatemala Correct answer A. The struggle to control North Africa Extending the conflict between squire and knight, the duchess now inquires about Dulcinea. Don Quixote says that he has found her, but she is now enchanted and transformed into the ugliest peasant girl that one could imagine. Embodying his own egalitarian lesson to his master, Sancho takes the radically opposite view, appealing to the duchess for support. I don't know. It seems to me she's the most beautiful creature on earth. By my faith, Lady Duchess, she leaps from the ground onto an ass as if she were a cat. He goes even further, discrediting his master's claim that Dulcinea is enchanted. She's as enchanted as my father. Chapter 31 concludes with the ecclesiastic expressing his disapproval of both the Duke and Don Quixote. The backdrop is a complex web of social relations, a priest, a pair of nobles, an hidalgo, and a laborer. Literary critics tend to take a negative view of the ecclesiastic, especially modern critics who sympathize with Don Quixote, whom the ecclesiastic calls a simple soul. Nevertheless, we have heard his advice before from Sancho and from Don Quixote's niece. Anticipating the anti-colonialist message of Voltaire's Candide, the ecclesiastic even embeds a quote within his speech to Don Quixote telling him what others should say to him. Return to your home and care for your children if you have any, and tend to your estate. And stop wandering about the world, gaping at the wind and provoking the laughter of all who know you and all who don't. This infuriates Don Quixote, who, with a furious glance and an agitated face, stood up and said, but here we have yet another interruption to be continued in the next chapter. That's all for now. Keep reading. The story gets much better in the coming chapters. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.